So this is uh, Unit 7, Lecture 5, the last of the series of personality. The next two will be intelligence after this. Uh, so uh, what have we talked about with personality so far? So far, we've talked about the psychoanalytic perspective of personality. Freudian, everything is unresolved sexual tension from your childhood, all in your unconscious. The neo-Freudians and the psychodynamic thought was more of a collective unconscious, not as evil, not all based in sex. Uh, we talked about the humanistic, where you just want to be the best you you can be. Last lecture, we talked about the trait perspective, which is kind of taking an inventory. doesn't really tell you how you got there, but this is what you are. What you see is what you get. I am what I am, as Popeye would say. Uh, and now we're going to talk about the social cognitive theory of personality, which goes more with the nurture uh, side of personality, which basically says that we surround ourselves with people and these people help shape us. So our personality chooses these people, but these people we choose shapes our personality, which impacts the people we choose, which impacts our personality. It's a real chicken and the egg sort of thing we got going here. So that's what we're going to take a look at here to wrap up personality. So the social cognitive perspective, uh, biggest proponent of it it would be Albert Bandura, and Bandura goes back to the Bobo Dow. Remember the Bobo Dow uh, experiment was the child uh, watching his parent in the room, basically abusing a toy, and then deciding whether or not they would do it as well. So three major factors, what we know, which is cognitive, what we feel, which is our efficacy, our feeling of our controller, what's controlling over us, and also what we observe, which is normal behavior. And remember, most of our learning is latent learning, where it's learning without realizing that we're learning. So this is all built from research on learning and cognition, but it fails to consider anything that's unconscious, you know, very much like behaviorism. Uh, really doesn't take the unconscious. Social cognitive perspective should be able to trace everything on a conscious level. But again, that takes away from the times where we're just like, I, I don't know why I did that. Um, so again, personal characteristics, the environment, all the, and our behavior influences all together will give us our personality. And as we've mentioned before, and we'll talk about in the final unit, the cognitive behavioral therapy is perhaps the most predominant psychological approach in explaining uh, human behavior. It's also the most effective therapy uh, that a lot of times who we are depends on how we think. Uh, and if we would think better, we would be better. And when we think worse, we are worse. So sometimes one of the simple solutions to a lot of our problems is sometimes just changing the way we think. But that's also really hard. Okay, so there's uh, reciprocal uh, determinism that goes on uh, during this time, uh, which again becomes this chicken and the egg argument, uh, where you could ask this. Uh, question um you know you take a network like mtv and i don't think mtv is as popular as it used to be but let's just take a channel that appeals to teens now does this channel appealing to teens does it look at what teens are doing and then go oh we need to make a program about that or does it make a program and then people go Oh, that's what we should be doing as teens, and they act that way. You know, this is always one of the big complaints about television is, oh, television is affecting our youth because they're doing these things, or is television more of a reflection of our youth? And we see ourselves in that, and that's why we so much watch. So again, what this has to take into account in, the, in this reciprocal determinism is that different people choose different environments. You, you, you choose your environment, but then once you choose that environment, that environment shapes you, which leads to your choice, which is also, by the way, why we change environments. One of the great things about life that you're discovering as a teenager, and you'll discover more when you go off to college, is that life is a series of reset buttons. I'll also give you this little factor that I probably haven't before. If you have moved at least two or three times in your life as a high school junior or senior, if you have moved at least two or three times in your life, you are more prepared for college than the person next to you who has grown up in the same neighborhood their entire life because you're used to change. 
And then sometimes, again, back to adolescence, that's what we do is we change. We change our friend group because we don't like how this group of friends is impacting who we are. So then we try to grab another group of friends. And, and again, at the same time, we're impacting those friends. Our personalities shape how we interpret and we react to events. Anxious people will watch things that confirm their fears and give them more anxiety. The people who watch Shark Week are already scared of sharks. And all they're doing is confirming, yeah, that's it. That's the reason why. Those guys right there, that's why I'm afraid. So... Yeah, it's just really sort of a, a weird thing. And then people that have confidence or have hope or have dreams or aspirations are going to watch programming or be around people that will continue that. Our personalities help to create situations in which we react. Remember the study we talked about with speed dating, men who were told they were attractive acted more attractive. Guys who were told they were less attractive acted less attractive. And you build yourself based on what others say about you okay people who are mentally healthy that, that, that's, is it is based spelled right there hang on based based yeah b-a-s-e-d i guess because it's all caps it doesn't do it i'm sorry got a <laughs> <laughs> got a little distracted right there okay anyways you build yourself based on what others say or biased or bias oh my god that wouldn't be right you build yourself based on what others say so people who are mentally healthy let's get back to it if you're a mentally healthy person you're going to surround yourself with other people that got themselves together you know if you're enjoying life you're going to surround yourself with other people who are enjoying life you know you're not going to hang around bad people or downer people or whatever which is again one of the reasons why you want to be in a good mood you want to get invited to the party i mean it's like hey should we invite steve no man stephanie just broke up with him he's gonna bum everyone out by the bean dip you know so so what we put out there determines whether or not we get involved in particular things because people with a negative view of themselves are drawn to others that reflect those same thoughts as a matter of fact some people will take advantage like pariahs they'll just go oh that's a person feeling bad about themselves if i continue to make them think bad about themselves then they'll have to they'll think that i'm as, as good as they can get you know and again this is why you see people in these abusive relationships man the guy who will put his girlfriend down and put her down and put it down is because she'll never think that she can do any better than this guy it's a very manipulative controlling thing we want to be right about our self schema and keep it stable even if it's bad even if we think bad about ourselves at least we're predictable we're not going to surprise ourselves with greatness you know it's so but if you expect greatness you're more likely to get greatness you know you you, you reap what you sow uh, without trying to sound too much like a fortune cookie here so there is what is called the biopsychosocial approach which we've talked about consistently in this class who i am physically impact and how i feel physically impacts how i think and how I think is going to impact how I deal with others and how I deal with others is going to impact how I feel and how I think and how I deal, you know, and it's just this constant feeding pattern that's going on again and again and again. Every moment is shaped by our biology. Hell, what we are right now was affected by everything that's happened to me up until this day. You know, and what when who I am as a person is impacted by everything that happened within my family tree going back millennia that has led to this particular moment. So, again, depending on on who you are, you know, the, how you'll react to surroundings could be different. You know, a threatening situation can turn one person into a criminal, another person into a hero. You know, so it's is there is who we are. We're not all going to react to situations the same way. Boiling water turns a potato soft, yet it makes an egg hard because they're different things, you know, more than anything else. So what a lot of people push is what is called a positive psychology. Part of the social cognitive perspective is if you think good and you put good out there, you're more likely to get good. Are you still going to get crap sometimes? Sure. Yeah. But you realize that that's temporary and it's no big deal. 
But if you think bad and you think think negatively, you're only going to accept the negative. As a matter of fact, when you get the positive, you'll go, yeah, but I can't depend on that. You know, and you'll reject the positive. Optimistic people tend to lead healthier, happier lives with less stress because they have a proper perspective. When the going gets tough, it's a temporary thing. But the person with depression, the person with anxiety thinks that, what's going on bad with them, it's always going to be bad with them. And it affects everything we do. When we realize if you think positively and somebody cuts you off in traffic, you're just going, oh, well, you know what? That's a jerk and I'm never going to see him again for the rest of my life. Whatever, I can move on. But man, if you're thinking negative about life, like, why, why do people always get in my way and I can't do anything? This is just my life. I might as well just go home. That's a negative attitude. Okay, but again, at the same time, we can't have excessive optimism because obsessive, obsessive optimism, excessive optimism or obsessive optimism can sometimes blind us to reality. You know what? I'm not going to go up and ask Angelina Jolie on a date, a little out of my league, not to mention the fact my wife's better. My wife is so much better. You know, my wife's not going to bring home adopted children. Uh, just adopted animals is pretty much all I'm ending up with. And I'll have to put them in college. Now, the spotlight effect. <sighs> we are in our lives. We are the most important person in our lives. And that's true. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with you thinking that you're the most important part of your life, person in your life, because you are the most important person in your life. The only person that you are guaranteed to go through life from the cradle to the grave is you. So, of course, you got to be important. And if you're no good for you, you're no good for anyone. But then where we lose perspective sometimes is we think of our self-importance and everybody else sees us as important as well. That's where we have something called the spotlight effect, where we overestimate others noticing us. A big phrase amongst people, especially amongst young people, is the term everyone. Everyone's going to notice. Everyone's making fun of you. Everyone or no one. You know, it's these extremes. It's not like some people. It's everyone. And so we think, again, we are the stars in our lives. And when other people come into our lives and then interaction happens, we think they look at us as that important as well. Now, again, when determining, let's say the spotlight effect, are we being looked at? We got about six degrees to the left and six degrees to the right, where I'm really good. I got about a 12% out of 360. I'm 12%. I can tell whether or not somebody's looking at me. You looking at me? You look at you looking at me. Are you looking at me? You, you, you. 12% I'm good at. Everything outside of that, it's a coin flip. So we assume they are. We always assume that other people are looking at us. And again, this goes back to evolution and danger. And do I have to worry about that? What's going on over there? So again, outside, we just assume that people are looking at us. And since we assume that people are looking at us, we, we assume we are important in this scene to their lives. Okay, we are the star of our own lives. We're in every scene, but we're not the star of everybody else. And again, they asked a group of students. I don't know why I said that again. Uh, maybe because I've given this lecture quite a few times. Uh, but they asked kids to wear kind of an embarrassing outfit. In this situation, back in the 1970s, they told college students to walk into your university lecture hall wearing a Barry Manilow shirt. Now, if you don't know who Barry Manilow is, I'm sure your grandmother loves him. Uh, I kind of got a kick out of him. But he's just kind of a corny guy that appealed to older ladies. Um, piano player, quite a showman. So these people were asked to wear a Barry Manilow concert shirt uh, into class. And their assumption was it was going to be embarrassing because everybody was going to notice. As a matter of fact, the average person thought 47% of everyone in the classroom would notice and make judgment. When in fact, only 23% of people even noticed and fewer than that even cared or made any sort of judgment, whatever. It's like, oh, okay. Okay, go rock with that. Now, when, now again, our friends will notice it and they, you know, just completely, you know, rip us apart. So when speaking in public, we notice our own insecurities more than other people do. I mean, when you got to give a presentation in class and you're sitting up there and the paper shaking in your hand and everything, you think that people see the paper shaking everywhere. They don't know. When you feel that piece of sweat, piece of sweat, that drip of sweat, 
it's a piece of paper. When you feel that drip of sweat that goes down your brow like a waterfall and works its way down your back and goes right in your butt crack, you think that everybody just sees this flow of water coming down your face. But you know what? Those people watching you give your presentation, they don't notice the damn thing. As a matter of fact, they're not even paying attention to your presentation. They're just waiting for you to stop so they can give you the obligatory applause. All they're thinking about right now is, boy, I hope he goes longer because I'm really not prepared to go today. They're in themselves. They are their own spotlight. But a lot of people crave this. You crave these sorts of things. Uh, Social media's confirmation of this, my story, my Facebook, my thing. We assume that other people can't go on without my influence. As a matter of fact, some sad people out there have the profession of influencer. Really, that's a thing where that is, yes, I am an influencer and my fans and my people and my followers, if I don't say something on the internet, they can't go on with their lives. They're following thousands of other people besides you, all right? But again, how people react to us, we take much greater than what that was. Think of how many things you've liked or, or smiled at or whatever on social media as you're swiping and swiping and swiping but when that person sees oh she liked it oh she liked it why do you think she liked it she was there for half a second but you're thinking about it for 10 minutes so our self-esteem is our own feelings of high or low self-worth and people who feel good about themselves are happier they're more successful less drug use why would i use drugs if i'm a happy person you know, why would I want to get high or drunk if I'm happy? I'm, I like my life. I like the world the way it is. Why would I want to go into an altered state? Which is why people who are depressed, people who have anxiety, people who aren't happy with the status quo of their life are far less likely to want to go into this altered state. Low self-esteem comes in two forms. First, you fall short of hope. You fall short of hope that leads to depression, or you fall short of what you thought you ought to be, which leads to anxiety, which is a great, great fault that is that, that you're going through because you're thinking, oh, I got to get into this school. No, you don't. It doesn't matter where you go to college. It doesn't matter. You know, it, it really does not matter. And I, I'm sure I've said this before, but let me say it again. All that matters, you go to school, get a degree. You wherever you go to college, it's not going to get you a job. You got to get you the job. You got to get through that interview and everything else. It might get you the interview, but it ain't going to get you the job, you know? And then when you get your second job, your second job doesn't care where you went to college or even how well you did in college. They want to know what you do with your last job. You know, it's a moment in time, but since it's your future, you put all this stuff into it. Esteem levels can lead to our opinions of others as well. Tell someone they did well on a test, they're much more charitable. I did well, you could do well too. Tell someone they did poor on the test, they're a little bit more judgmental and critical of others. I did bad on the test. Well, yeah, of course you did good because you have no friends and no one wants to hang out with you. You know, they're, they're mean during that time. So when we explore ourselves, when we explore what impacts us, a lot of it has to do with our personal control, our self-efficacy, which I think we've talked about prior in here, back when we talked about motivation. Remember, our self-efficacy is our ability to sort of drive our environment. Again, we're going, life is a river, we're in a canoe going down it, but do you put the oar in or not? And if you put the oar in, you're gonna control the speed, you're gonna control the direction and all these things. People who are higher achievers, more independent, enjoy better health, less depressed, or people who have an internal locus of control because they think their actions matter. They think what they do makes a difference in their lives and maybe even in the lives of others. You have people with an external locus of control. These people think, hey, no matter what I do, it doesn't matter because the Illuminati and QAnon and all these other things control everything. So you might as well not even try because the government, few of them all meet in Virginia every year. And no matter what we do, and Bezos and Amazon ordering on, they're just sad. <laughs> They're really, really sad, but it's an excuse for their laziness. You know, why even try? Why even try? Why even lose weight? Why even lose weight? I mean, we're all just going to die anyways. Yeah, <laughs> but you might as well enjoy the ride. 
you got to enjoy the ride. So again, those with more of a sense of self-control face less stress and are more likely to live a longer life. You're just more likely to live and live longer. The higher your hopelessness score, the more likely you are here when we take a look at mortality rate, you know, you're, more you're, you're, you're gonna survive more if you have a lower level of hopelessness. You have a high level of hopelessness, you're gonna die sooner because why would you eat right? Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. And again, we have this self-serving bias, which we've talked about a little bit earlier with humanism, this readiness to perceive ourselves favorably. And again, we can't all be excellent. There's nothing wrong with being average on a few things. Again, half your friends are below average. You know, not everyone can be above average. Most people see themselves as better than average. 90% of business managers, 90% of college professors rate their performance as superior to the average colleague. But let me ask you this. If you're a college professor, if I were to rate myself right now as a teacher, I couldn't effectively rate myself as a teacher because I haven't, I don't, I teach all day. I'm not watching other people teach. You know, so I really only have myself to compare to. So how dare I say I'm an above average teacher? I've never taught myself. I've never been the student, you know? So this inflated sense of self-worth leads to more aggression when we feel threatened by others. Well, I deserve this. Someone's gonna take it from me. I'm special. I gotta watch out. I gotta hold on if you're trying to take it away. Self-serving perceptions are on the rise in America from social media to song lyrics. Every song that you hear in pop culture is all about us and we and tonight and what we did last Friday night and tonight and we're all together and we will, you know, those types of words. 2008 study of college student self-esteem, 51% of students scored a 35 or higher on a test where the highest possible score was a 40. 40, Just go, half of people are 35 or better. Again, remember what we talked about with Dunning-Kruger a few uh, units back. Those that are at the lowest level tend to overestimate their abilities to, to a lack of understanding of the complexity of the issue. I, I, I can't admit that I'm in the bottom 25%. I couldn't live with myself if I'm in the bottom 25%. You know what? I am in the top bottom 25% of things. Things like this. Uh, here, I'm going to draw. There we go. Do a little cartoon guy right there. I'm a below average cartoonist. You know what? I'm okay with that. I'm okay. Some people are better at art than I am. My wife, much better at art than I am. I'm okay with that. She's way above average. I'm below average. It's okay. It's all right. You know, we can't all be great. You know, if all of us have a million dollars, are any of us rich? No, we're all average. We're all average, okay? So, and sometimes average is a good thing. But then we have this feeling above it, and th th this is narcissism. Narcissism and excessive self-love and absorption. And again, you got to like yourself. You even do have to love yourself. But then when you're upset that other people don't love you as much as you do, that's when it becomes a problem. That's generation me, generation like, you know? People who feel, I think I am a special person is much higher than it's ever been. 3.2 billion people in the world are on social media. So what makes you so special? You know, it's, if everybody's got a megaphone, who's going to shut up and actually listen? It's just everybody talking and talking and talking. And it's, it's the rise of reality programming because we're never going to run out of subjects. People will do anything to sort of get on. And unless, and sometimes we can't even exist unless we have the approval. We can't even enjoy without the approval of others. This, right, this is something that drives me crazy. I'll see people at a restaurant and they get their food. Waiter comes over and goes, hey, there's your food. Hey, there's my sandwich. Let me take a picture of it. I'm going to take a picture of my sandwich. There, took a picture. Going to put it on social media. I am about to eat my sandwich, send. And then suddenly people go like, yeah, you do like it, don't you? Love, you love it. Oh man, lucky, I am lucky, wish I had it. Yeah, but you don't, I do, envious, I can enjoy more. Just eat your damn sandwich. Who cares what anybody else has to say?
<laughs> you know, if someone posts a picture of a sandwich on social media and I see that picture, my friend, I hope you choke on it. That's what I say. What? what? And it will actually destroy their meal. If I, if I text my friend, I hope you choke on that sandwich and die. Why would you? I will destroy their meal because they can't enjoy it now because someone is not envious. That's a relationship I have with my friends. I'm not a kind person sometimes. And again, this narcissism correlates with more selfish behavior, material. And by the way, I, I don't want my friend to die. I'm just screwing with them. Uh, materialism, desire for fame. Well, which friend? Uh, inflated expectations, fewer committed relationships, more hookups, more gambling, because we think we're special, we're going to win. Cheating, because I'm special. You know, inflated expectations, because I'm, I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be great. That's not going to happen to me. Yeah. Well, think of the guy who's on the corner with the sign, flipping it around, doing a good, honest day's work, flipping around that sign, pointing at the apartments that are for lease. I think that was his dream in high school. You know, we're not all going to make it. You know, there, there's, there's limited. So you got to be happy for what you got instead we, and, and not be envious and, and take what you have. Don't think I'm better than this. It's what you are at that moment. But again, the selfie. Oh, the selfie. Oh, the selfie. Stop it. This guy in Paris, the Eiffel Tower. You're looking at the Eiffel Tower. You're looking at an iconic thing on this globe. You know what would make it better? My head. No. Just show me the Eiffel Tower. Show me the Grand Canyon. I don't need to see your face in front of it. As a matter of fact, people have died falling off the side of the Grand Canyon. This lady right here, it's the Roman Colosseum. You can't see it. It's behind your head. I'd like to see the Colosseum. I know you. I've seen your face before. It's like, no, I got to prove I'm here. So you're just lucky. Wish I was there. Just enjoy your vacation. Just take pictures. I got a bunch of pictures. I was in D.C. Let me see if I can pull them up here. Uh, I was in D.C. Uh, recently, and I took a bike ride. I took a bike ride at night around Washington, D.C. If you ever get a chance to go to D.C., I highly recommend you take a bike ride at night, 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock at night. It's fantastic. As a matter of fact, that's that's right there. That's the – you can't that, – that's me. I was taking a – I flipped it. Uh, man, really should have planned this and downloaded these pictures. Um, here, there, right there. That's the bike ride that I took around Washington, D.C., kind of a map. Um, but yeah, I took these pictures as I was on a, just a bunch of pictures of my cat. <laughs> my cat looks like, my cat looks like a, uh, looks like a walrus. Anyways, um, yeah, when I took it, here we go. Supreme Court, iconic pictures, Capitol building, Capitol building, Capitol building, Capitol, monuments. There's a lot of pictures of the Capitol. Oh, that was me riding a bike down Pennsylvania Avenue. But anyways, nowhere in here do you see my head because I want to see the iconic stuff, you know? But, but, but a lot of people do this because it's an insecurity really, that you won't believe that I was here. I take your word for it. Look at this picture, Yellowstone Park, Ansel Adams, one of the most famous photographs of Ansel Adams collection. It's really kind of fascinating. If you would have made it a selfie, it would have looked like that. Not quite as magical. Ain't gonna put that in a calendar, all right? Now shyness is the other side of this. Shyness is a feeling of apprehension, a lack of comfort, awkwardness, especially when we're in proximity to other people. As a matter of fact, if I was there right now, if I were to say, show of hands, how many people are shy, you would see their hands go up kind of like this. You know, um, maybe someone's gonna see that. More likely an introverted personality, not necessarily. Some shy people are very, very outgoing because they're sort of insecure and they wanna kind of take on another act. Primarily defined characteristic of shyness is largely fear. Fear of others are watching me and what are they gonna think of me? Difficult for them to take a compliment to a lot of insecurity. Oh, I just got lucky. Anyone would have done that. Uh, sometimes it's not addressed in school. It becomes especially overwhelmed when surrounded by narcissists. Um, there's what's called the imposter syndrome. Anxiety is created 
created when starting a task. When it's completed, you can't accept credit for the success. You feel the praise is undeserved. It's not genuine. When you're assigned another project, the cycle just repeats itself. It's, and it's bad. I mean, self-doubt is healthy in doses because it encourages you to do better. But people who are maladaptive perfectionists, you know, get into this imposter syndrome. People are going to realize that I'm not really as smart as I as my grades say. So there's that extra anxiety and pressure a lot of times. Uh, and again, you can't take a compliment. I'm really bad about it. I'm clinically shy. And I know it may not seem through these videos or if you see me in class, in front of a crowd, it's easy. One-on-one -on -one conversation, very difficult for me to do. When I'm in a room alone, it's kind of simple. Uh, but yeah, I'm clinically shy. I am bad in one-on-one -on -one conversations. I'm bad at a party and all these other things. And I'm terrible at taking a compliment. You know, my wife, uh, my wife will say to me, she, she'll go, you're very handsome. You look very handsome today. And my immediate response is, how much wine have you had to drink? I can't take the compliment. But it's actually very mean to her to, to say that. You know, for me to 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 not allow her to have that compliment or for me to make fun of myself, which I do. But she goes, well, what does that say about me that I would be with you and you're just a bad person? That's a valid point, too. So you kind of want to find the in between. And again, we talked about this before, introverts versus extroverts. An introvert is a person who's a bit of a loner values few close relationships, very careful in what they say and who hears it from. Usually thought of as a shy, but not all the time. You could have a high level of confidence, but be an introvert, you just don't want to be around other people. An extrovert, on the other hand, is a person who gets their energy from other people, has a large group of friends, and makes decisions based on satisfying those friends. So it's great that you have a lot of friends, but you're also indebted to those friends. So it's harder for you to make decisions without taking them into account. Uh, constant need to be the center of attention can often be due to the need of validation. Please look at me, please like me. Uh, different things there on introverts and extroverts. Last thing we need to talk about here, though, will take a minute, is culture and self-esteem. When we talk about the social cognitive perspective, some of what may make us who we are is the type of culture we're in. In spite of the world of judgment, those most likely to suffer uh, discrimination don't necessarily have low levels of self-esteem. As a matter of fact, if you faced a lot of discrimination in your life, what you've sort of learned to do is develop a little bit of a thicker skin, you know? Boys have higher suicide rates than girls uh, when girls face much more discrimination. Whites suffer depression more than any other group when whites are less likely to face discrimination. Value things that excel and compare to others in their own group. When you take a look at the highest suicide rate, and I think we've mentioned this before, white males, here we go, white males over the age of 65 have the highest rate. Why would that be the case? Sometimes white skin can be a little bit thin uh, because you haven't necessarily dealt with some setbacks that others have. So when you get a setback, it can be overwhelming. You know, Blacks, Hispanics, Asians, other groups, uh, women, gay people have learned to blow other people off when they say things demeaning or whatnot, just go, oh man, it's, them, it's their problem. Or sometimes when you've never really faced discrimination and somebody says something mean, you take it a little bit more personally. And by the way, I'm not saying that, that people, Black, Hispanic, Asian, homosexual, women, whatever, or a combination thereof, don't take things personally. But sometimes due to environment, Skin can become a little bit thicker. Now, again, when we talk about the culture that you're in, there's individualistic cultures and collectivist cultures that we've talked about. Individualistic cultures tend to be American cultures, European cultures, Western cultures, if you would. Giving uh, where, the, where the, the job is you. It's all about you. I've got to get to my goals. I need to get where I want to be. I define my identity by me rather than the group. My importance is best. You're more likely to experience a change in lifestyle, more likely to change jobs. Don't let the job define you. More likely to change religions, more likely to move to another part of the country, if not to another country. More freedom, more choice, more happiness, but also more stress because 
you can choose anything you want. I can marry anyone I want to marry. Fantastic. But what if I married the wrong person, man? That was my fault. I can become anything I want to become. I, I can major in whatever I want to major in. But what if I choose the wrong major, man? That was my fault. This Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic, weird group where it's all about the person. And what's interesting, what's interesting is the other culture, the collectivist culture, is an Asian culture. It is a we culture where you give priority to the goals of the group, often your extended family. You go into the family business. You defer to your elder. The focus is on being polite. The focus is on not sticking out, not rocking the boat because the boat's got to take a group of people there. Greater degree of in-group bias, more likely to judge other groups as inferior, more likely to accept an innocent person going to jail because it will stop a big social disturbance. Levels are on the decline because there's an increase in uniqueness of baby names. There's more social media and all these things. As a matter of fact, collectivists, if you take a look at these, uh, these uh, Chinese proverbs, they're actually, you know, may you live in interesting times. May you be recognized by people in high places. May you find what you're looking for. You would think that that is that people from an individualistic culture would love to open up a fortune cookie and read that. But if you are from a collectivist culture, those are looked at as Chinese curses. May you live in interesting times. I would like to live in interesting times, really. A pandemic's pretty interesting. That's not normal. That's a little unique. Is that really? I mean, wouldn't you rather life to be a little bit more boring, a little bit more predictable? May you be recognized by people in high places. I'd like to be recognized by people in high places. Would you like to be scrutinized by them, judged by them, ridiculed by them, blocked by them? Hmm. May you find what you are looking for. I'd like to find what you're looking for. Yeah, but what if you find it and it's a disappointment? So you see where an individualistic culture would see these as blessings. A collectivist culture would see it as a curse. So again, individualism, the United States is a very much me-centric group. Americans come from people who refuse to blindingly comply to the rules of their homeland, yearning for something better. When you think of all the immigrants that came to the, well, not all the immigrants, but most of the people who came to this country were yearning for something better. And by the way, again, I, the exception in slavery, I, I get that. But the majority of people who came here on their own were yearning for something better, freedom, excitement, wealth, a better land, Statue of Liberty, the whole thing. 99.1% of Americans are descendants from 500 years of migration. 12% of all Americans are first generation immigrants. 12% of all Americans are second generation immigrants. You're talking about a quarter of the population. Whereas a collectivist culture, an East Asian we culture, many of the nations of Eastern, Age, uh, of Eastern Asia discourage immigration. Japan is an island, cut themselves off from everyone. Growing of rice needs to be done in a collectivist way. 10,000 year history of needing other people to eat. It's a high, high, high labor intensive thing. It's important to divide the work and food with others to ensure that everybody eats. The U.S. skipped this using slavery for crops that required high labor for numbers. And then it wasn't food, it was cotton, and that wasn't feeding anybody. An area of northern China grew more wheat due to the climate. Because and well, you grow more wheat, you need less of a labor force. Well, this area of China that grew more wheat and less rice and needed less of a labor force also resulted in more of an individualistic culture, higher rates of divorce, higher rates of patent applications and inventions. Now there's caveats to this comparison. This is talking about these groups on the average, okay? Plenty of Westerners that are collectivists and vice versa. You know, there's plenty of people where the family is very important, faith, all these other things. Variations within cultures. You know, urban Beijing is not the same as the mountainous Tibet. UCAL Berkeley is different than going to Brooklyn, which is diff different than going to Biloxi, Mississippi, which is different than going to rural America. There's very, even though we live in the individualistic United States, there's a lot of different types of individualism. So when we talk about these cultural differences impacting personality, 
Individualists are defined by autonomy, personal achievement, uniqueness, looking out for number one, focus on the needs and the rights of the individual, whereas collectives are more interdependence, needs the group to guide behavior, which is why you see nations such as Japan and Korea not having the COVID outbreak that may, many countries like the United States and Western Europe are, where it's my right, whether or not I wear a mask or take a vaccine, collectivist culture, you got to do what they tell you to do, and you don't want to rock the boat. Not saying one's right and one's wrong, but there's a difference there. Uh, traits. Individualistic seeks uniqueness and personal accomplishments, uh, whereas collectivists will not volunteer a correct response in class because they're afraid that if I say the correct response in class, I'm going to make everybody else look back. I don't want to shame the other students because they don't know. You know, whereas we will be me, me, call on me. Uh, Self-reflection. Individualistic cultures use first person singular pronouns to find themselves personally. I am a contractor. Take credit for success. I am really good at this. Collectivists use group pronouns more often to find themselves relationally. I'm a parent. Take less credit for success, right place at the right time. They're better at theory of the mind, seeing something from someone else's perspective. Norm violations are blamed on the group because the group felt pressured. Pictures of themselves are. When, when somebody from an individualistic culture sees a picture of themselves strongly active in the prefrontal cortex, ooh, look at that picture. Ooh, what do you think other people think of that picture? Ooh, should I have taken the picture differently? You know, how does this relate to others? Whereas a collectivist person, someone from a collectivist culture sees pictures of themselves, it's strongly going to activate the amygdala, fear, anxiety. Picture of a person in a scene, the individualistic culture is going to describe the personal characteristics of the person, look at the center and work outwards, whereas a collectivist culture tends to look at the whole scene and then eventually go to the individual person. Memories, individual more likely to remember personal events. That's the summer I learned to swim. More likely to remember a time that they influenced someone else. You remember needing help being stressful. Um, Collectivist past is remember more in relationships. That's the summer I met my best friend. Uh, more likely to remember a time someone influenced them to, to remember when they influenced someone, did they influence them enough? A little bit more stressful. Dopamine uh, is released for an individual when they look at an excited face. Collectivists, when I look at a calm face. Uh, problem solving, linear fashion, linguistic, do it, you know, in a row. Uh, versus collectivists take the advice of others. Explaining ball movement. <laughs> if a ball were to move, I know this is getting into minutia, but an individualistic would say this ball moves because it has weight and it has density. Okay, that's why it's moving. Where the collectivist culture would point out more of the friction on the floor and, and gravity and other things. Estimation, absolute. How long is that line? Collectivist relation, how much longer is that line than the wall? And which go together? Monkey, bear, and banana, which goes together. Individualistic culture would say the monkey and the bear. Why? They're both animals. Look at them as individuals. The collectivist culture, which two go together? The monkey and the banana. Why? The monkey needs a banana to eat. How's it related? So again, culture can have a lot to do with our personality and our personality the definition. That wraps up personality. Next is intelligence.